Newton's universal law of gravitation is one of the most important turning points in physics. And that's because it really is universal. It really is universal. I was in physics class and the teacher was saying, uh, you know, uh, bumblebees can't fly. There's, it's impossible. They can't, aerodynamically they can't fly. And I was on the second floor of the classroom and I looked out the window and there was a big beautiful bumblebee staring at me right in the eye. And he was standing there doing something that this guy said he couldn't do. I've never forgotten that, that lesson. And so from then on, I understood that he was right. Bumblebees can't fly. They levitate. In natural law, there's, there's only one law, and that's you either know or you don't know. There's no guesswork. It's like you know when you're hungry, you know when you want to sleep, you know when you want to uh, go to the restroom. They're, these are knowing. These are all natural knowings. It has a, a great deal of difference from the synthetic or, or <laughs> invented uh, system of of guesswork, of, of belief, if you will. You can believe this, but somebody can come along and get you to disbelieve it, and vice versa. So you go around and around and around <coughs> all, all your life sometimes, for some people, and never seem to get anywhere until you stand up and look into natural law, which is either you know or you don't know. And if you don't know, then you proceed along a line that's comfortable for you. You proceed into the subject matter that you're studying and you don't give up until you know what it is. You don't, there's no more guesswork. And you don't have to try to do this because if you're following natural law, it will come to you. All you have to do is start it. The first step is just, I want to learn this, I want to know this. And just start it and pretty soon it will start teaching you. These are all natural knowings. It has a, a great deal of difference from the synthetic or, or <laughs> invented um, system of, of guesswork, of, of belief, if you will. And then there's Newton's gravitational constant that just sets the scale. It tells you the overall strength of gravity. The bumblebee, when he starts to beat his wings, when he starts to flap his wings, there's a little cavity, a hollow cavity, next to the larynx inside his, his system that's hollow. And when he beats his wings, he starts to resonate this energy, and it goes back and forth, just similar to, um, to a guitar strumming on one side of the room and hitting the same chord on the other side of the room, or... Uh, somebody hitting a high C and breaking a crystal. It's the same thing. It's resonance. And he said, what they do, they resonate. And when they resonate, they eventually reach the resonance of the field around them. And he says, once this bumblebee hits that resonant frequency of its surroundings, it becomes a free agent. It creates a magnetic bubble around itself, and it can go anywhere it wants. And I said, well, that's not in any of the science books. He said, I know. <laughs> you, know you probably never see it there either, but that's, that's what happens. They'll discover it someday and bring it out, but it, it's just uh, we have a conventional way of doing things and we have a natural way of doing things, and they're totally different. They're diametrically opposed in many, many cases. This might look like a radio-controlled bee, but it's actually a bee with a little radar transponder on it which means that we can track this bee as it flies around the field. And these little guys can carry 90% of their body weight in pollen, so it won't affect the way it flies. 
force between two objects depends on only two things, the mass of the objects and the distance they are apart. And these little guys can carry 90% of their body weight in pollen. First of all, the bees are flying much faster than predicted, an incredible 30 miles an hour, even when fully laden. The next surprise is where the bees go. They almost always overfly potentially decent food. And once they've found their patch, they then repeatedly shuttle to and from it. And this is the really clever bit. In spite of 30 mile an hour crosswinds, whether out or back, they all fly in dead straight lines. They all fly in dead straight lines. So a man named Grabenikov from Russia, tomology, was a, he found a certain bug that didn't fly, it levitated. The, the bug wings themselves uh, were creating an anti-gravity phenomena under certain conditions. And of course what we have here, if, if you analyze, I, I think I found the bug. It's actually a beetle. And if you analyze this bug structure, you see a hexagonal pyramid structure array throughout the entire bottom wing of this bug. Turns out that beetles have two wings. The top wing is, is called a wing cover. And what the beetle does is it lifts this wing cover up and then it flips out its lower wings or inner wings. Now the, the bug cover protects the inner wings, but when it gets excited or something, it flips these other wings out and it, it flaps these other wings and the other wings, the inner wings flap a little and this beetle goes gyrating around. They can't fly very good, but they sure levitate great, I guess. Now I don't know of any aerodynamic surface that has bumps all over the bottom to help it fly better. If you blow this up to 430x, uh, you can start to see some of this microstructure of the uh, cells that form uh, where these bumps are. The next slide at uh, 970x, you start to see what these bumps that stick up are. They're a uh, hairs, look like hairs or uh, fibers that, that grow out of the center of these hexagonal cells. And of course, this harkens back to my basic shape power discovery is that each one of these, because of their uh, shape going down to a point is creating a magnetic field. And remember, a magnetic field is a rotating piece of vortex in the ether. Oh, by the way, Brennikoff says there are the two most common materials in this world are cellulose, because it doesn't decay, and chitin. Chitin is spelled C-H-I-T-I-N. That's what all insects are made out of. Chitin. It's the shells, the body, it beetles, roaches, butterflies, everything's made out of chitin and it doesn't dissolve and it doesn't die. So, But what's interesting about chitin, chitin is dielectric. The Casimir plates are dielectric. They repel electricity. These nanostructure arrays, when you look at them under a microscope, this is what they look like. This is excreted by the bug in growing its tissues, you know, the, the chitin. That's what it looks like as you, as you go significantly greater magnifications. That's what you see, finer and finer. Looks like it's machined, it's almost perfect. Go to the next one, please. This is even a finer magnification. And these are those little resonating cavities that appear to pick up the lower you go, the higher frequencies, like a straw with a certain frequency, like organ pipes. As the organ pipes change in, in, in length, the frequency goes up. So the deeper you go into mass with these resonating structures, eventually you're going to hit Cater's frequency below infrared terahertz, and you would be able to cancel gravity. So this, that's what all this is leading to. This one particular bug, he won't tell us if it's a beetle. A beetle or a butterfly or some kind of a wasp. We won't, won't tell the genus of the insect. He says, I'm not naming the class to which this insect belongs. It seems on the verge of extinction, but uh, he's, he, you know, you got to protect as much as you can. And he, he doesn't want to give the name of this because he thinks if this gets out to the world, they'll come in and take every bug they can. 
I wrote him a letter and I said, look, we don't care about the name of the bug. Just send us a couple of samples. If we can duplicate the effect, prove it's not electrostatic, it's not electromagnetic, we can make artificial, just uh, you know, analyze it with an acoustic microscope, I mean a scanning microscope, get the specific dimension, is it hexagonal, you know, tet tetragon, tetragon what? And make it into an array. What is the structure, the size? Is it on angstroms, micrometers, what? And just run off sheets of this stuff. And remember, a magnetic field is a rotating piece of vortex in the ether. Giant asteroids are coming towards the Earth, and they're going to destroy us all and, and, and kill us all. Um, NASA has created a plan to stop it so we don't all die. Uh, what's a potential space force actually for? I mean, I'm just saying. Are we preparing for an invasion? Because that would be fun to just think about that. I mean, it wouldn't be fun when it actually happened, but wouldn't it be fun... I mean, we're starting to hear all of the stuff being released, you know, by uh, by the Pentagon about all of the about all of the aliens that have visited us for a while, and maybe that's what the space force is for. Let's just call it um, Armageddon. The Armageddon report. Okay, the report is 18 pages of steps for NASA and FEMA to take over the next decade to prevent big asteroids from clanking into the Earth. Now, you might ask yourself, why FEMA? Well, you know, in case the NASA part falls uh, apart and uh, they don't, you know, stop the asteroid, then we got FEMA. There is a lie being told to everyone that the weaponization of space is now first being based upon the evil empire, the Russians. There are many enemies, he said, against whom we're going to build this space-based weapon system. The first of whom was the Russians, which was existing at that time. Then there would be terrorists. Then there would be terrorists. Then there would be terrorists. Then there would be third world countries. Now we call them rogue nations or nations of concern. Then there would be asteroids. And then he would repeat to me over and over 
And the last card, the last card, the last card would be the extraterrestrial threat. Well, at the time, I kind of laughed when he said asteroids, and when he said extraterrestrials, I knew I wasn't going to deal with that subject. And now we hear on the news just today, this week, that they've slid in another enemy. Only this time we're going to protect our satellites. In other words, we have to have some reason to spend these trillions to waste these dollars on a space-based weapon system, and they're all lies. Lost in a romance Wilderness of pain And all